Okay, welcome everybody to uh, Deep Dive with DUI. Um, and uh, it's, it's going to be a pretty uh, exciting program this, this month. Um, we have our guest speaker today is, is Casey McKinley. Um, he is out of Florida and he is the lead manager, project coordinator for the Woodville Cars Plains project. Um, so for today, um, I'd like to remind everyone that you are, um, please, if you have any questions, please submit them in the comments area of, the, of either Zoom or Facebook and we will answer them if they apply at that time um, or um, when it's appropriate at the end of the, at the presentation. Um, today's presentation also is best viewed in the speaker mode. So the speaker is in, in the highlight of, of this whole presentation. Um, and one thing we'd please ask is please don't um, do, I know we're, we're on Zoom and please don't comment or draw on the screen if you have that capability, especially on your mobile phone. Um, it just, it's, I guess it's one of those things that we can't control at Zoom. Um, so without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce Casey and I'm going to, uh, hang on, it's always technical difficulties on my end. Um, there we go. So, and I remove myself from the spotlight and you should be able to I see Casey now. To... So, so Casey, welcome. Yeah, welcome, Jack. Thanks. Uh, do you want me to screen share now or just wait a second? Uh, well, why don't we wait a second um, and okay. people will be jumping in. Um, so I'm so glad that you're they're able to present this, this month. Uh, it's something that I look forward to learning more about. I know I got a little sneak preview a couple of days ago. And as most of our viewers will probably see it, you'll sit there like I did go, wow, wow. <laughs> You know, it's well, just you, amazing. Well you, well, you got the pri you got the private VI VIP presentation, so um, it's always good to carve some time out of an afternoon and spend it with uh, fellow divers, fellow technical divers, fellow cave divers. I've seen a few of my uh, uh, team members uh, sign on as well, so that's always uh, reassuring. So. Um, you know, it's challenging under current circumstances, at least, uh, at least at work. But one of the nice things is getting outside and getting diving, cave diving in particular, uh, is, a, is a nice kind of uh, reality check away from the day-to-day -day grind and, and the current circumstances we're all uh, adjusting to. So diving is still an escape. And cave diving is most certainly an escape. So happy to be here. Yeah, especially during this time. I mean, it's not um, around the US and in other countries sometimes, uh, right now diving in general is not really something everybody has an opportunity to do. So um, being in California, San Diego, I'm kind of lucky I have diving right in my back door. Um, uh, just an interesting note, uh, not that anyone's gonna really care, but the local dive spot that everyone just kind of goes, oh, it's so boring in San Diego, La Jolla Shores. Yesterday afternoon, a group of divers uh, had a, a small gray whale um, just join them during the dive. And so it's like someplace that's a tourist area, you wouldn't expect that. And all of a sudden you see a, a gray whale diving with these people. So it's, so you never know what you'll find sometimes. Yeah, Anyways. indeed, especially in cave diving, but anyway. <laughs> well, that would be even more exciting, right? Sure. Um, so go ahead and um, share your screen and, and let's okay. get started. Sounds great. Well, uh, Get this going, see if it looks good. If it does, uh, great. How are we looking, Jack? Good? Great for me. Okay, great. Um, on behalf of the Woodville Cars Plane Project, I'd like to thank DUI for the invitation to uh, uh, speak today and to just kind of give everyone a little bit of background who may not know about uh, me or the Woodville Cars Plane Project. I will give you a brief overview. Uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, I've been a cave diver going on 30 years now. 
And I've been fortunate enough to spend about 25 of that as a member of the Woodville Cars Plane Project. Um, I've also had the opportunity to participate in some of the uh, biggest technical dives, cave dives uh, ever done, uh, thanks to a great team that we have and uh, resource partners that we work with in our various project sites and um, uh, sponsors that help us with good equipment and and uh, luck helps every once in a while, but hard work and preparation uh, really make the difference. Um, I've also had the opportunity to travel and dive with fellow explorers all over the world in various cave systems, learn from them and, and really establish uh, lifelong friendships. So um, this diving is a passion of mine and I also happen to be uh, one of these fortunate people whose uh, job crosses over into their passion. So uh, I'm uh, lucky uh, day in and day out. So uh, the Woodville Cars Plane Project uh, uh, has been a big part of my life cave diving for the past uh, 25 years. Uh, the project is actually coming up on its 30 year anniversary and we are located uh, out of North Florida uh, currently, we have about 75 active team members, including international members that join us uh, from time to time when they're visiting here in Florida. Uh, we've had uh, hundreds of divers over the years that have come into the project and contributed and, and gone on to uh, other things or gone back home and started their own projects. So we're fortunate enough to have that. Uh, rough numbers, these are always a bit of a, a guess uh, in some circumstances, but maybe 8,500 dives over the years uh, on behalf of uh, our team divers, 400,000 hours uh, in, in these cave systems since 1990. And we are a 501c3. We're a nonprofit research entity um, whose members uh, cover their own expenses uh, to participate uh, uh, in project activities. And to assist with our mission, which is to explore, survey, document, educate, and support research within the cave systems of the Woodville Karst Plain. So exactly where is the Woodville Karst Plain? Um, if we zoom in a bit here on, uh, on, on uh, the North Central Florida, for those of you that might be familiar with the Florida Panhandle, Tallahassee, uh, the Woodville Karst Plain is located due south of Tallahassee. And basically what it is, is a 450 square mile limestone plain that is riddled with cave systems, uh, karst features, springs, and a lot of that water is draining down from uh, South Georgia and North Florida down towards the Gulf of Mexico and passing uh, through these cave systems. So that's fresh water. Uh, currently, there are roughly 45 miles of mapped cave passageways. So it's a pretty significant uh, area for uh, uh, karst cave systems. And within that 45 miles, the Wakulla Leon Sinks cave system makes up 35 miles of it. And the Wakulla Leon Sinks system is the largest underwater cave system in North America, and it's the largest cave system outside of Mexico. Um, the WKPP for the past 30 years has been responsible for mapping about 31 miles of that of, of these cave systems with more than 22 miles mapped below an average depth of 190 feet. And we remain very active year to year. Uh, in fact, uh, just in 2019, we mapped and explored uh, more than two miles of cave passageway in these various systems. And I'm gonna to touch on some of the systems that we're currently active in. We don't have time today to uh, touch all of the systems, but we can give you kind of a good idea uh, and a good perspective uh, for these, for these systems that we explore. And I did jump over it, Jack, but um, I wanted to just take a brief moment and, and uh, uh, say thanks to DUI for a shared commitment together over the past 30 years to 
support the project, uh, develop uh, products, and uh, allow us to uh, test products that make our diving easier. Uh, yeah, clearly, you're, clearly you're the exp yeah, thank you. <laughs> clearly, the uh, dry suit exposure suits are a very critical piece of equipment on every dive. And unlike other things where we can bring spares, there's only one dry suit on us. So it has to work uh, uh, each dive and it has to be reliable, uh, especially when you're managing a team of people. So we appreciate the support. Uh, from DUI over the years and, and look forward to uh, years to come. So thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Yep, uh, fast forwarding a little bit here. If we, if, we, if we zoom in on the Wakala Leon Sinks Cave System, I did mention that currently it's at 35 miles of explored passageway. There's 27 known entrances into the cave system. And we really call it the Mammoth Cave of underwater caves uh, with billions of gallons of fresh water flowing through it each day, making its way from the high ground uh, down towards uh, the ocean. And of those 27 entrances, uh, I'm gonna start at, uh, at Wakulla Springs and in the Wakulla section of the cave, which is the southernmost section right now. And Wakulla is significant for a lot of different reasons. Uh, clearly, the cave system is one of the largest in the world, uh, so the geology is, is impressive. Uh, it's also uh, culturally significant, given the uh, uh, impact to the local community and uh, proof or evidence that uh, visitors have been coming to Wakulla Springs for uh, thousands of years. So uh, the archaeology, the history, uh, it has a big economic impact. Uh, to the local community and to Florida's park system in general. Uh, but it's also one of those resources that uh, is vulnerable uh, to, to humans uh, upstream and in daily use. So it has to be uh, um, uh, managed and uh, uh, research is a big uh, part of that, giving the resource managers the data they need to uh, protect this resource. Um, this is an old image. Uh, clearly, uh, clearly a few years ago, but it's such an impressive image that I keep using it uh, uh, year in and year out. So that's an aerial view of the Wakulla Springs Basin. And that right there is uh, the start of the Wakulla River that runs many miles down to the Gulf of Mexico. So all the water for that river uh, comes out of the cave system in that spring basin, which is center right on your image. Uh, it's very, very impressive, both from the air and equally impressive when you look at it from a depth of 150 feet, looking out to the surface. And that particular image was taken under very clear water conditions, which uh, unfortunately, uh, year in and year out are, are becoming uh, fewer. There's a lot of different reasons for that, but uh, rain and, and and uh, water withdrawals and, and other circumstances are, are impacting the water clarity at Wakulla Springs. But when it is clear and the window presents itself, we try and make the most of it as cave explorers. Has that been changing through the years from when you first started doing this? Like, are there more instances of the water clarity not being as good from um, human environmental type things or anything like that? Uh, it has, in fact. And one of the benefits that we have as a diving project, especially doing this for 30 years, is we have a 30 year uh, image of what it was and how it has changed over the years. Um, I don't have statistics to say this is the percentage of blue water days now compared to years ago, but it has dropped significantly. And some of that is just uh, water dynamics in the Wakulla Springs Basin in that area. Uh, rainfall factors in, uh, rising sea level puts a little bit of pressure on the, on the water system and then water withdrawal. So growth in the area and people are pulling more water out of the ground uh, to use. And of course you have cities and agriculture upstream that also have an impact of, uh, on the quality and quantity of water coming to Wakulla Springs. So it's a very complex dynamic, Jack, that 
on in, in different circumstances that uh, can cause the, the water uh, to darken uh, and, and not be as clear as uh, what you see in that image. But occasionally we do get uh, this, this clarity. Uh, this clarity does return and we have to be ready as explorers to get in and take advantage of it. Uh, I mentioned briefly uh, history and archaeology at Wakulla Springs. So uh, the, the spring basin itself and even inside the cave systems, there's evidence of uh, 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 mammals going back uh, tens of thousands of years. But that's a collection of mastodon bones at a depth of about 20 feet in the Wakulla Springs Basin. In fact, they've pulled several mastodon skeletons out of this spring basin over the years. So uh, that's a bit of history that you see as you as you as you dive, and then separately from that, there's a lot of research going on in the springs to monitor the quantity of water coming out of uh, Wakulla, archaeology, uh, and then uh, uh, water quality as well. And for those of us that live in Florida, and this could also apply to uh, many uh, who have joined us today in their local communities. There's a fair amount of impact on Florida Springs in general. Uh, humans are having a big impact and that's going to be a constant challenge going forward to keep the water clean and keep the water flowing and, and deal with uh, uh, threats to, to, uh, to these eco ecosystems. And as cave divers, um, we do what we can to provide critical observational data in uh, data from hardware that we help install that gives resource managers additional information and helps them helps them manage these problems and minimize these impacts, but it's still a challenge. And Jack, you had mentioned uh, many years ago, uh, the image on the left was more common. So clear water conditions throughout the year and, and less, less green or dark water, but what you're seeing on the right is an image that is more common than, uh, than we would like. So dark water entering the system, uh, turning it from uh, blue to a green tint, and then sometimes uh, the amount of dark water overwhelms the system and it's, and it's dark as coffee for extended periods of time, which makes exploration difficult. Uh, but when those windows present themselves, uh, we really, do our best to explore. And this is just a short video of one of the primary clear water tunnels that uh, uh, feed water out to Wakulla Springs. And we'll just kind of let this run. I'll narrate it a little bit, but it's uh, it's a primary tunnel that uh, connects to the main Wakulla Central Tunnel. And the dive team here is actually leaving the Central Tunnel about 700 feet into the cave system and turning, making a hard left into one of these side passageways that is what we call a clear water contributor to the cave system. So water that is coming in from these tunnels is typically deeper, clearer water. And just the scale and visibility as cave divers is seriously impressive. And this is going upstream, correct? Yeah, this is going into the passage. Uh, the dive team right there is uh, actually passing a scientific uh, flow meter that we assisted with the install and that flow meter is literally taking the pulse of the cave system uh, uh, daily and recording that data. But as cave divers, just, just the size and scale of the Wakulla passageways, the extensive nature of it and the variety is impressive. So the dive team here is several thousand feet into the passageway. The average depth here is roughly 300 feet. Uh, they're using propulsion systems with uh, large offboard lighting. And the camera guy typically has his work cut
cut out for him because keep in mind, he's cave diving, he's operating a DPV and he's running a camera system um, all while inside a cave at 300 feet. So, uh, but absolutely beautiful passageways among uh, many of the many of the different sections of this incredible cave system. The Wakulla section and the Wakulla tunnels are the most impressive. So I had a question, is the RV-80 still the preferred diving system of choice at this point? It is, and I've got a brief slide towards uh, the end of the presentation, just to touch on uh, briefly on some of the equipment, but given the depths and distances, two critical pieces of equipment that we rely on uh, uh, now more than ever clearly are the rebreather, and we do use a semi-closed rebreather system, which works very well for us in these systems. Uh, it is the RB80, and then uh, propulsion. It's just not practical for many reasons to swim long distances at depths in these cave systems. So propulsion is a critical piece of everything we do. And um, both for safety and, and for capturing video footage uh, as, you, as you've seen today. So so, I love, the, I love the, the dual DPVs. <laughs> yeah, it's really something that uh, we're working on more now than we have in the past. And there's different reasons for that, but just the stability and the ability to mount systems and camera systems on there uh, and for riding long distances, the dual systems with their counter rotating benefit really make it easy for the driver to fly it in large cave passageway. In a smaller cave passageway, it's not as practical, but we don't spend a lot of time in small passageway, as you might imagine. So for the camera aficionados out there, so what are we using exactly on that dive, for example, and other dives? I've got a few other short videos, but we are running a variety of uh, Keldon lighting systems. So in the, on, on most of our dual units now, when we're in big cave passageway, we're running the Keldon 24Xs. Um, that's gonna give us a lot of light. So for those 24X lights, it's about 140,000 lumen, or roughly the equivalent of 100, 100 watt light bulbs. Uh, it's a lot of light, really lights up the big passageways and, and we can make them neutral and it's, it's a very nice product. So we're running a couple different camera systems. Uh, uh, the last video was a Sony Alpha A6500. I've got another video at the end that's using the A7S3. And then uh, we've got uh, for shallower stuff and special stuff, we're using a Canon C200, all with Nauticam housings. And then we sneak in uh, GoPros here and there to get different perspectives or if it's exploration specific dive, we can't bring, bring, bring the large cameras, we bring the GoPros. So a good balance. And I mentioned Jack, we're also relying heavily on propulsion these days. So the dual unit system on the left and the single units uh, on the lower right. SUEX like DUI has been a big partner for us and in both uh, uh, supporting us with good hardware, reliable hardware, but also listening, listening to our requirements and suggestions to improve the product. So when you take good propulsion and you take a well-trained diver and you take good camera equipment and you mount it all together, that's kind of the setup you get. And for most of the video that we're shooting in Big Cave right now, that's the setup. So the small dual unit SUEX system, which offers really nice balance with big cameras, uh, big lights, big arms, and uh, a good pilot, and you get good footage. If we leave Warcala and we fly northwest, we enter a different section of the Warcala cave system, it's what I refer to as the Emerald Sink section. And within this area, we've got uh, some beautiful, beautiful sinkholes. Uh, Number one is really Emerald Sink, which kind of anchors this area of the cave system. Emerald Sink is also an area that's currently open to recreational cave diving. So when conditions are clear, it's not uncommon to see uh, cave divers travel here and, and dive this system. 
So it's, uh, it's quite beautiful um, uh, when it's clear. Uh, nearby, there are several other entrances. Uh, some are open to divers, some are not. Uh, this is Cheryl Sink across the road from uh, Emerald. And it's a short 20 foot drop down into the cave there. And historically that used to be the entrance uh, cave divers would use, but now it's kind of closed off and everyone goes in at Emerald. If you travel farther upstream to some of the deeper sections of the Emerald cave system, uh, the carved out nature of the passageways, the rock features, the scalloping and the limestone uh, are all indicators of a lot of water flowing through here over a long period of time. Uh, this is a, uh, a great shot of Blake Wilson, one of our lead exploration divers about 4,000 feet upstream uh, at a depth of about 200 feet here. And uh, this was clear water conditions and, and really an opportunity to get some good shots. Uh, just another brief video, Jack, of uh, some of the sinkholes in this particular area. So you have emerald, sink, Cheryl sink, uh, split sink, circle chasm sink. Quite honestly, all within swimming distance uh, at an average depth of maybe 45 to 60 feet. So that's not very common in, in, in this big cave system. A lot of it does go deep. But at certain times of the year when the water is clear, it's, it's very impressive and quite enjoyable to swim through these sinkholes. And to some extent, it reminds me a little bit of Mexico. We were talking about Mexico the other day. Right, yeah. Just the shallow natures and going from cenote, cenote to cenote is, uh, is impressive. And also the, the under, in the caves themselves are, are different because uh, you were mentioning that the, the Mexico caves are different as far as like they were dry for a substantial amount of time, which creates the stalactites and stalagmites where the Florida caves were primarily underwater the whole time. That is correct. And uh, full disclosure, I'm not a geologist, but your general comments are right. Uh, Mexico's systems were dry and wet and dry and wet, and they were that allowed them to we, we refer to that as those caves are much more decorated, whereas the Florida caves didn't uh, undergo that same sort of uh, evolution. And they're, they're beautiful in their, in their own way, but you don't see a lot of uh, uh, decorations in, in, in the cave systems. And I like how all these caves are, you're showing these huge expanses. And so many people think that cave diving, squeezing through tight little you know, 18 inch square spaces. And it's like, no, you can drive like a giant bus through them. You know? So you, you, you can in many of the areas of this particular cave system. However, there are a lot of cave systems in Florida that do require a, a squeeze here and there. And, and people do that uh, quite often. Uh, so a lot of side mount systems in Florida, but not so much, not so much here. So if we travel south a little bit into the River Sinks Turner section of the Wakala Cave System, another collection of uh, entrances and, and sinkholes uh, anchored, anchored by Upper River Sink, which when this picture was taken, it was uh, absolutely beautiful. So quite clear, you can actually see down into the, uh, you can see down into the limestone ledge. So that's the shot from the surface and that's kind of what it looks like underneath. So a little bit of a darker, uh, unrefined feel to it, but exploration is active upstream and downstream from this entrance. So it's a pretty remarkable area of the cave system and one we've been very active in over the past couple of years. Are most uh, of these so open to the public or do you have to have special permission to get to these areas? Well, as I mentioned with the Emerald section, uh, Emerald Sink itself is open to recreational cave divers. You have to be certified, you have to pay your daily use fee. 
But in large part, you can come there and, and dive with uh, no special access permission required. Uh, there are one or two additional sinkholes in the system that allow that. But there are certain sections of the system that for various reasons, including the main spring at Wakala, that are closed to rec any type of recreational diving and, and special permit use only. So we're fortunate enough to um, have Earned, earned, earned the special use permit uh, privileges over the years, and we continue to deliver good data and good results uh, for our stakeholders, including the state of Florida, and, and, and that allows us to uh, renew that permit each year and continue working. So uh, some recreational, but also some special use access only. Right, if we go downstream a little bit from river sink and get into the Turner sink section. Uh, as you mentioned, there's there's no squeezing through this cave section, uh, Jack. It's uh, quite impressive. You can see all the scalloping on the walls and the strange shapes and clearly indications of a lot of water moving through here over a long period of time. So uh, it's fabulous when it's clear like this. When we took this image, it was kind of right on the edge with some tannic water coming into the clear water and making giving us that green sort of tint, uh, but it also gives it kind of an eerie feel. It's a great shot by David Ray, who's been one of our long-term team photographers and explorers. Uh, another shot, so large cave passageway, big video systems. We've got the big Keldon lights out front. And even as much light as we have, it's still sometimes difficult to light it up. So you can see that green tint a little bit, um, the darker water mixing with the clear water, uh, but not unlike Wakulla. If we travel into the cave uh, for about a mile or so, there's a deep spring infeeder that entering into it, visibility goes really clear, blue, and another great shot uh, at the entrance of this tunnel from David Ray. Uh, depth here is about 150 feet. The team coming out at the bottom of the passage is closer to uh, 200 feet, uh, but plenty of, plenty of space to move around. And we've got some nice video of this section of cave. So Clearly again, Jack, no one's, no one's squeezing through this section. <laughs> uh, it's probably 30, 40 feet from the floor to the ceiling. Uh, it almost has a cathedral shape to it. Uh, the dive team is coming up over a big rise. And now they're traveling through this uh, tube shaped section, which is equally impressive. Average depth through here is maybe about 150 feet. And the main passage continues straight at this particular junction, but the team is going to take a hard right turn here and go into this blue, deeper blue water tunnel and you can see what happens to the visibility. So through the years on some of these sections that you've gone back and forth through, have you noticed any like physical changes like collapsing or, or any structural changes? Or are they pretty much been stable through the years? Relatively stable. However, we have seen indications in this particular section of some ceiling collapses over time. So if we come back after six months of dark water and dive, and then we find a section where the primary guideline in the cave is gone or missing or buried with a big rock on it. We know something fell from the ceiling and covered it up. Uh, that's not very common, and it's very unusual to actually ever witness that, but these caves are still evolving. So the water has a corrosive effect and um, they'll continue to evolve for thousands of years and, and, and get larger or smaller or collapse and change. So uh, geologically, it's, it's unusual that we would see that, but occasionally we do see indications that 
the cave is changing uh, right in front of us. So briefly on the equipment side, someone asked early on if we're still using the RB80 as our preferred rebreather. We are. So the image in the upper left-hand corner is, is basically the uh, semi-closed uh, RB80 unit. It's been extremely reliable for us for more than 20 years. We have about 30 team members that are trained on it. And it's not the it's not the it's not a it's not the optimal rebreather for minimizing gas usage, but it has a lot of benefits for us diving in this system where the profiles are relatively known. Uh, it's mechanical in nature, so it just works, and that's the simplest way to put it. And it's been uh, perfect for our purposes over the years. Uh, the WKPP still standardizes much of what it does, both in terms of an equipment configuration and standardized breathing gases. So uh, the MODs on the tanks in the upper right-hand corner are a typical exploration complement with a deep 300 gas and then a 190, 120, 70 foot and oxygen decompression gas. Uh, we standardize that because it makes it easy for managing large groups of divers in the water and uh, with a 20 year track record of um, getting it right, so to speak, uh, it keeps the divers safe and makes things really efficient for us. Yeah, that seems really important, um, especially from a safety standpoint. You don't want we do and you don't want some random element coming in. Absolutely. And as technical divers, one of the biggest issues we all manage out there is just gas gas cylinder protocols and, and managing the different mixes underwater and making sure that we know what we're breathing and and uh, uh, mistakes like that uh, have cost uh, trained train divers their lives and, and experienced divers. So it's something that we manage every time we uh, get out and, and get in the water. Uh, we're also continuing to be very conservative with our bailout planning. Um, a good portion of uh, a good portion of the tanks that go in the water on every single dive uh, come out full, and that's how we like it. It's a little bit more labor up top, but that's that's what we want to do. And if we plan our bailout conservative and everything goes well, then that also allows us the opportunity to get aggressive uh, and push exploration opportunities when they present themselves. So, uh, still a lot of gear. Still a lot of rebreathers and dry suits and scooters and cameras and, um, but it's right. it's, so, uh, it's so all part staging, of the diving we do. Yeah. So are you staging these as drop tanks along the route? So you have planned places where these are put. Absolutely. Some will be uh, dropped along the route. Some will be front run by setup teams for the exploration teams, and they'll come in and clean sweep everything out at the end. Um, some of some of these are also uh, uh, bailout decompression cylinders. In case you have a rebreather failure and you have to complete your decompression on open circuit, then you want to be able to have enough gas in the water to be able to safely do that. So, um, lots of tanks. So, typically, how big is the team on one of these, um, including the surface support along the way, just to get? you know, your farthest distance and depths in these? It, it always depends on the uh, depth profile of the plan, but on a large exploration dive, typically we're looking at between two and four support divers per exploration diver. So if we're gonna put an exploration team in the water, a two person exploration team, and then maybe a two person setup team, so that's four divers, we would rot somewhere between we would probably go with a surface support team of maybe 12 uh, because some of these decompressions are lengthy and rotating support people in and out just to make sure everything's good and cleaning all the equipment out. It's nice to have uh, team members on the surface and, and they show up uh, ready to help and to contribute. And it's really a, it's really a total team effort when we get in the water. And I assume during your decompression that everyone's setting their, um, their, their dive computers to the same gradient factors and, and all that stuff, um, be consistent on that. 
um, and not on an individual basis, or are they set up as individuals? Well, we're still heavily, we rely heavily on the dive planning element of what we do. So we're running different profiles using uh, table generation software. We will also wear mixed gas dive computers, but usually as a backup, Jack. So okay. uh, we know when we get in the water, what our estimated bottom time is. And then we have tables that we've generated with uh, uh, gradient factors or safety factors of you, as you just mentioned. Uh, it's typically within the same parameters for the divers. We all kind of gravitate towards a conservative profile and stick with it. And then we'll, we'll follow those tables on decompression, uh, but we'll also reference the decompression computers as secondary, but not primary. Uh, and then compare those and on occasion, download that data and compare it to the tables and it'll give you a sense of kind of where, where we're at and how we need to adjust those settings. Uh, but we're definitely not computer dependent in any way. You know, we have a good idea of what we're getting into uh, on the tables and we're not also doing a lot of multi-profile diving. So usually it's descend down and it's a steady profile for most of the dive and, and then coming back and decompressing out. And I thought this would be a good slide based on our conversation the other day, people asked, well, on the long dives, you know, how are you eating anything? And do you have uh, air bells or habitat, so to speak, that you can spend some time in before, as you come back to the surface to add some comfort to the decompression, so to speak. So the top left is a typical decompression air bell that we would put on a ceiling inside a cave system. So 150 gallon, 300 gallon water tank that flips up upside down and filled with air. So you can get head and shoulders out of the water. Uh, you could probably eat something and uh, take your mask off and kind of relax a little bit. You still have to you know, supply your gas from your regulator, but those are nice. And then a secondary element to those habitats in certain areas is they also serve as a safety area. So in the rare event, we might have an unconscious diver uh, that can't come to the surface. We could extract them into one of these habitats and try and manage the situation there. So would you um, have so uh, communication set up for those also? Uh, we don't. It's usually support divers will come uh, in and out. We've we've tried some uh, comms to the surface before and had mixed results with them. But uh, with dive teams in the water, we usually have support divers in the water, and that's the chain of communication. Uh, old school a little bit, so write down the notes and take them back to the surface and uh, keep them updated that way. So. The one on the top left is a basic one. If you see an image on the top right, uh, that's a larger habitat that we've actually built a floor into. And then you can see us kind of uh, on the lower left image. That's actually uh, myself and Terry Koritz, uh, who lives out your way and comes back and dives with us uh, a couple times a year. But it's comfortable relative to being in the water. So. 30 feet, you can do a large portion of your oxygen decompression in there before your final ascent to the surface. And you can get out of your equipment. And of course, you got to put it back on when you get back in the water. But uh, it's a nice break for a couple of hours in there, uh, which is the longest part of the decompression. And uh, to the right are just a few images. People always ask, well, how do you eat anything? And we use transport. To, we use dry tubes, which you can kind of see on the right there with the lid off of it. So we can put some sandwiches and food in there and, and seal them and then release the pressure and open them up underwater. And we still use camelbacks uh, for drinking uh, throughout the dive. Uh, we'll put some Gatorade in them or um, whatever someone prefers and, and bring those with us and strap them to tanks. So every couple of hours, even, even on a long bottom time, it's nice to stop for, for a minute or two and drink something to stay, to stay hydrated. And yeah, people keep for, forgetting that that's an important part of diving, especially um, also to minimize the decompression 
um, possibilities because um, you don't want to be dehydrated. <laughs> that's correct. That's correct. So staying hydrated, uh, A's in the A's in the decompression uh, after these long dives and and four or five six hour bottom times, sometimes longer. That's a long time to go, especially with the diuretic effect and um, stopping and and having a um, right having a half liter of something to drink and then getting back to work uh, really makes a difference. So. That's that's a very convenient way to transport liquid uh, with us when we go on docks. So, what are our average water temperatures since this is fresh water and it's flowing? So it's pretty consistent. Average water average water temperatures in most of the Florida systems, this one included, are between seventy and seventy two degrees Fahrenheit. Um, Just still pretty cold after as many hours as you're talking about. It it is. You know, I I've got good friends that dive the cold cave systems of Northern Italy and then Scandinavia and France and elsewhere. And they come to Florida and they're like, it's a jacuzzi to dive in. Well, it is maybe initially, but I tell you what, after, after a couple of hours, even in 72 degree water, you want, you want good insulation. And then also on these long decompressions, Jack, we're supplementing with uh, electric uh, heating which you wouldn't think you need, but it's a really nice thing to have. And then there's also some decompression benefits uh, to that as well. So um, yeah, 72, 72 degrees gets, gets cold after a while, no doubt. So if we leave the Wakulla system, I'm going to try and I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but if we leave the Wakulla system here, we start making our way south towards the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, in recent years, we've been doing a lot of work uh, in the Shepherd Spring Cave system. And Shepherd is part of the St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge. So this is uh, under Fish and Wildlife Service. So this is a federal special use permit, but it's a fabulous cave that divers started exploring uh, back in the 70s and 80s. And recently we found our way past some restricted areas and it's really turning in, turning out to be an exciting exploration project with, um, uh, with more than uh, a mile explored and surveyed just in the past year and a half. And Shepherd is very close to the coast, as are several other spring groups nearby. And it has been proven that a lot of the water flowing through the cave systems upstream, upstream including the Quella systems, are that water is making its way south and discharging into the ocean, uh, which, is, which is quite common. Um, the, some of these cave system or some of these spring vents have also been uh, confirmed with uh, with dye tracing, so they know the water comes here. Uh, however, they don't know the path the water takes, and that's kind of our job, which is exciting. So, uh, Shepherd Springs is one of those systems, and this is a great shot recently from one of our team uh, photographers and explorers, Chris Warner. So. Shepherd Spring Basin lit up with uh, big video lights on a very cold 30 degree night. And yes, there were a few alligators in there, uh, but they didn't seem to like the lights a whole lot. So they kind of uh, swam away for a while, but a spectacular sight above the water. And that's a good image of the new exploration about a mile and a half in. So, so are you finding much life this far into the cave? This is a this is an interesting cave, Jack, because unlike some of the other caves where you can find some, some cave critters, uh, we're yet to find any life in this cave system. We're not exactly sure why that is, but one of the reasons we're in there is because the resource managers want to understand a little bit about what's going on here. And there could be different reasons for that because of its close proximity to the coast. Uh, it does get uh, some saltwater intrusion. So there's some uh, salinity to this water. Uh, 
there's also hydrogen sulfide in the water. And with salt water and fresh water mixing at different levels in the cave, you get critters that eat that and generate the hydrogen sulfide. So we can't really see those critters easily, but we don't see any eels or crayfish or anything else in the cave. We do see some stuff in the spring basin, alligators on occasion and fish, but inside the cave, nothing. So very unusual, but water, good water flow uh, through here and obviously a well-defined cave passage. And the new section we're in is quite impressive. It's actually bigger than what you see on that image. So we're looking forward to going back soon. And we'll see if we can let this run. Yep. Again, this is a Department of Interior, so Fish and Wildlife. And this is a, a very small section of the cave passageway that we made our way through in recent years. And it we suspected it would continue to get smaller, but it actually started opening up a little bit. And the depth through here is about 170 to 190 feet average. But after uh, uh, about 1500 feet, the cave system actually began to open up nicely. And that's where our current area of exploration. So uh, the original explorers that pushed into this section were Blake Wilson and AJ Gonzalez. And we're continuing to uh, push, push it further out. And the refuge management is quite excited about their cave system uh, growing, heading north, and, and they look so, forward so to, to it. In the smaller work. sections, the, the current is stronger, I assume? Yeah, you'll see slightly stronger flow not not just because it it narrows down so you're trying to get more water through a smaller area so the velocity picks up uh, in this section here because of its size you do notice a little bit of discharge and some of that is tidally influenced meaning uh, meaning it should flow a little bit more when the tide is low but as the tide comes in the 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 discharge slows down a little bit uh, but it, it but it is flowing uh, the, the DPVs help a lot going through here and, and clearly we need them to get these type of distances. Uh, but just spectacular, spectacular cave passageway and we're really excited to, to go back. And you can kind of see on the diver out in front here, he's towing uh, some spare DPV units, and he's got a couple extra cylinders for the exploration part of the dive, which actually occurs at the end of this video. So we, we took video in the middle section of the dive, and then we left all the video equipment, and we pursued the exploration. Uh, we're going to probably do that on the next dive. So we're going to video the section that uh, we explored on the previous dive and, and kind of handle it that way. So we always come back with some new video, which people like. So there's a question about uh, the volunteers. What's the, uh, I guess, the demographics of your volunteers, age range? How many, are there women on your dive teams? I tell Stuff you like what, that. it's as diverse as you can imagine it. Uh, clearly, because we're a cave diving group, we get cave divers that want to come and volunteer. And our membership is really open to anyone who's cave trained. So if you're a trained cave diver, uh, you can apply for membership with the team. We rarely turn anyone away. Uh, of course, you gotta be a team player and follow our standardization protocols and, and, and we'll vet you a little bit in advance and then kind of work you into the mix. So even though you're trained, you gotta kind of learn, learn how we do things. But uh, if you're a trained cave diver and uh, age. So we've got a fairly diverse age range uh, from 20s to 60s, uh, professional backgrounds, uh, computer programmers, geologists, uh, 
dive instructors, engineers, um, marketing people. Uh, so it's really a, a broad cross section of, of occupations. Uh, we do have women cave divers on the team. Uh, in fact, some very uh, uh, skilled and accomplished senior team members, uh, rebreather divers and photographers and videographers. So uh, really what we look for are just good divers, uh, team players and people who want to uh, become involved in, in uh, the WKPP are accomplishing uh, difficult things and, and, and really challenging themselves to explore these systems that uh, are challenging, definitely. So uh, information uh, on the project, you can go to wkpp.org. Uh, it's not, it's more of a, uh, it's more of a static website. We're in the process of updating some of it, but most of our current updates and and uh, more recent images and videos and, and team information you can find on our Facebook page at Woodville Cars Plane Project. I'd like to just briefly thank, uh, thanks to DUI. Uh, I've listed a number of our res research and, and, and uh, stakeholder partners on here. Uh, obviously, uh, Florida Park Service and Water Management District and US Forest Service and US Fish and Wildlife at least under our special permit access, uh, our big supporters and partners of ours. And then also we've got a handful of uh, private landowners that uh, support what we do. And then of course, uh, our team members, uh, which make most of this, if not all of it possible. And then just some great video and images from our photographers and videographers. So Chris Werner, David Ray, Blake Wilson, Lauren Fanning, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, Sue. So, and then with, with that, Jack, I'd be happy, time permitting, to open it up to any questions that might have accrued or hand it back to you. So, hopefully, well, that one, of the, was, yep. one of the questions that, that came up was uh, regarding the dry suits. Um, what configurations um, do you look for in a dry suit? Um, it's like what options, what do you suggest are the, you know, the best things to look for when you're um, looking for a cave diving dry suit? Well, you might know uh, better than anyone what we look <laughs> for in a cave diving dry suit. Uh, clearly in cave diving, redundancy spares uh, are a big part of our planning with additional emphasis placed on those items that can be classified as single point failure, for example. Uh, I can bring extra cylinders, I can bring extra scooters, but there's certain things on my configuration that if they fail, the dive is done. Uh, dry suit is one of them. Uh, the rebreather is technically one of them as well. So uh, you have to treat the dry suit in a very as a very serious piece of equipment, especially when planning. So durability and reliability is key. As you know, we emphasize heavily the reliability of the metal zippers. We tend to go with glued on seals, primarily because we carry spare suits. If we have a suit tear issue, it's usually gonna happen on the surface or as you're preparing for a dive, it's very rare to have seal failures surprise you if you maintain your equipment. And they're usually not gonna happen underwater unless you cut it on a, on a piece of equipment, but we also wear seal protectors. So uh, glued on seals, good seals, good heavy duty zippers, uh, we like the uh, big heavy duty pockets that you can put on suits. Uh, clearly your relief valve needs to be uh, working well and of good quality. So uh, especially on those long dives, but um, dur durability, uh, good boots and good zippers and reliability are what we look for. And then what kind of uh, uh Thermal protection, are you looking at underneath? Um, what kind of undergarments? You, you mentioned uh, heated undergarments. Um, 
I know DUI, we're currently not selling the blue heat. Um, and just as an FY for FYI for people watching, we are working on a new version that should be pretty awesome um, okay. compared to the original version. But no, that's good to hear. To hear. We, using. yeah, we have believed for ever since I joined the team going back 30 years that uh, it's very important to have even in 70 degree water to have good thermal insulation and insulate based undergarments are critical in our opinion because if you do have a catastrophic suit failure or a major suit failure that thinsulate is going to maintain some insulation properties even when it's wet and if you couple that with the dry suit inflation we still use 100 percent argon to inflate our suits with uh, that thinsulate plus good dry suit inflation is really going to give you an edge whether or not you have a heated vest on or not. So we are using uh, resistance wire heated vests. Uh, we, even though the water is 70 degrees, we don't find it's that important to have a full body heated undergarment. So the vest is a, is a nice accessory item. And we usually, unless it's an emergency situation, we usually uh, hold off on using the, uh, the heating until the decompression portion of the dive to kind of warm yourself up to enhance circulation and off gassing, off gassing, so to speak. So XM450 undergarments complement that with a heated vest and a nice expedition weight base layer of Polar Tech. That's usually the combination that's worked best for us over the years. So there's also been uh, quite a few questions about um, your rebreather setup. Um, you know, what's, uh, you briefly touched on, you know, the semi-closed rebreather that you're using versus, and what's the advantage of that over the full, fully closed? And um, there's another question about why are you not diving dual rebreathers? Uh, so if you can address a little bit with, with the rebreather part of this. Well, again, the rebreather that we've chosen to use and really got behind more than 20 years ago is the Halcyon semi-closed semi -closed unit. And for us, it's not as important to have a totally optimized rebreather ratio, like a maximum gas ratio of 30 to one advantage so a closed circuit system that's going to give you uh, a higher ratio and more gas efficiency isn't really what we find is critical to our diving operations. What we tend to look for is reliability, durability, simplicity, and we get a lot of that from a mechanically designed rebreather whose signals are very intuitive. Um, couple that with our standardized gas usage. And anytime we decide to use the rebreather as opposed to open circuit, it's, it's almost seamless to kind of introduce that into our system or take it away. All the gases are the same, the procedures are the same, and it has really worked out well for us over, over a long period of time with many different divers who show up for any dive operation with different levels of diving currency. You know, the guy you're diving with on your left could have done 10 dives in the past month, and the guy on the right maybe did one. But because of the simplicity and how this works with our system, they uh, tend to be, they tend to, the system tends to be able to optimize those, those different levels. And then it, it's not complicated or we don't have a lot of failures when, when, we're, when we're using the systems. Uh, if you look at the diver in this uh, final image, the question image here, the doubles that are on the back of the diver with the rebreather situated in between, those doubles contain nothing but bailout gas. And if the dive goes as planned, the diver will come back with those cylinders full. And then a lot of the cylinders you saw on one of the slides, they're strictly bailout. 
And fortunately, uh, we don't have many systems, where, many situations where we have to bail out off the rebreather to open circuit. And that also speaks to just the simplicity in maintaining that particular unit and its reliability over hundreds of thousands of hours, uh, or maybe not hundreds of thousands, but thousands of hours uh, in these systems. Um, and the maintenance characteristics are, are also very low. Uh, I remember you had a question about dual rebreathers. Uh, we have experimented with dual rebreathers uh, positioned on the back of the diver, but that didn't really work out real well. It's too bulky. But on some of these very long dives, we'll position a decompression rebreather, we'll stage it. Uh, in the decompression area for the exploration diver to come off a primary rebreather and switch into a decompression rebreather. And then we also have the ability to transport a portable rebreather with us for redundancy or extended range if we need to. So it's designed to be side slung similar to the stage bottle you see in this image. You can put the rebreather there and plug the standardized gases into it. So. Um, just to close that out, the RB80 has been very reliable across a large number of divers on our team. It's proven itself over 20 years. The profiles of these systems are well known to us. So it's not like we need to be changing our gas mixes uh, constantly throughout the dive. And then the Shepherd Spring dive was the last video. We spent more than five hours at a depth of 200 feet. And we used basically the equivalent of a single aluminum 80 and breathing gas through the rebreather. So one aluminum 80 over five hours is pretty good ratio for us. And um, add that with uh, all the other benefits, we're gonna stick with the RB80. So we were talking the other day about uh... When you're lay, laying the cave line down that uh, I asked the question of how, what method are you using to map these out and talking about tying knots in the line. And then what's your, uh, someone asked a question about the SUEX synapse concept. Okay. Well, what we still do is on the original exploration we're still married to obtaining a hard copy of that as it occurs. So as explorers, it's important to capture that survey data as you're exploring it, because if you don't survey it, technically it doesn't exist. So old school Cartesian survey where uh, we're noting the depth at each uh, survey station. We're recording the heading and we're recording the uh, distance uh, via knotted line, knotted guideline uh, that's installed in the cave during exploration. We're gonna put all that in a notebook and we're gonna safely put that notebook in the pocket and bring it back to the surface because that's your hard copy. What we've been developing in recent years are some automated ways to just refine that hard copy data, maybe on a subsequent dive. So let's say, for example, we did the original exploration dive, we explored a half a mile of cave passageway and we got the hard copy survey. On the next dive, we're gonna to go to the end of that exploration and resume. But maybe before we do that on the way, we stop and we use uh, maybe the SUEX synapse nose cone to fly the path of that exploration. And then when we get back, we download that data and we compare it and just see that we got it right. And then there's other devices out there that cave explorers are using like the, the, the Nemo device that attaches to the guideline and records uh, heading depth and, uh, and distance. So that's an interesting device. And then we're using some more advanced systems that have inertial navigation capabilities and sonar capabilities to also fly that previously explored section of cave passage. So uh, we get it hard copy the first time, Jack, and then on subsequent dives, we'll get additional data and refine it and, and make it more accurate. So that's kind of my answer. 
Awesome. So yep. our, our time's pretty much run out. We actually went over, which is um, we could probably be here all day asking questions. Um, so I so I encourage you guys to or people to follow up and you know ask these questions online, um, uh, either on the Facebook page or directly to Casey. I'm sure you know we'll get these answers back to you. Um, so if I can get you to unshare your screen for a little bit now, that'd be great. Um, and then I really thank you for coming on and, and just uh, giving this whole presentation is is awesome. And it's it's one of my privileges right now to do these um, deep dives with DUI because they're it's always like, what does Jack want to know about? <laughs> um, I think other people will want to know the same thing. So this is why I'm doing these. So it's a so it's a privilege for me to listen to you and and, and be able to talk with you one on one about all this stuff. Um, so hopefully you can come back in the future, give us some more updates. That'd be great. Um, so and just to uh, also real quickly wrap this up um, next month there, we're kind of not doing a, a real deep dive with DUI. Um, so everyone knows that it, the scheduling is going to change next month. Um, that's due to uh, DUI. We're doing a, 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 I'd call it a virtual trade show um, around DUI. We're going to have all the different account managers um, talking about our, our dry suits, some of the different uh, gear and equipment, and also some new product announcements that's coming out um, in March. Um, so that will be kind of rolled into a multi-day um, type of event that everyone from the general public, which is all of us divers, um, to people in the industry. So we hopefully it's, it's it'll be exciting. So anyways, Casey, thank you for coming out and we'll see everybody uh, hopefully next month and, and the future deep dive presentations coming up. Yeah, thanks Jack, thanks for the invite. Thanks for everyone out there and uh, safe caving and and hope to come back and share future discoveries uh, with you and, and the group. And uh, I expect we'll have some this year. So take care and appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I'll wrap this up now. Thanks everyone. See you next, uh, next month.